All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. This is Bill Van Orstel at BookFuel with today's Wednesday webinar on how to optimize your Amazon sales page uh, to improve your discovery, your book's discoverability, and your sales. Uh, I think this is pretty important for authors who have a book in the market right now. Um, uh, I'm gonna. We've ch I've changed a little bit the format of how we're going to do these. So we, let's jump right into it. The first thing I want to talk about is sort of how this relates to um, buying behavior of your readers and your marketing. So your marketing typically comes in phases. As you market your book, you've got the pre-launch phase before your book's on sale. You get the launch phase, usually the first call of the first couple of weeks, maybe the first month or two that your book is out. And then there's the post-launch phase where you are. Uh, spending a lot of time trying to keep your book ranked somewhere up around 10,000, 20,000 or better, so you're selling a, a book or so a, a week or 10 books a week or so. So today, this, all the stuff we're going to talk about in the realm of buying behavior, which of course buying behavior starts with awareness. So people become aware of your book or aware of your brand as a writer. They become interested in what you have to say or what you've written. Then they either do a trial of it, or they evaluate it, or they look at how somebody else has tried it and evaluate it, and then hopefully they purchase. So everything we're going to talk about today falls in the later two, stage, two, two phases of your marketing, so the launch phase and the post-launch phase, and in the last two stages of buying behavior. So everything we do today, with exception really of interest, is about improving trial and evaluation and purchase so that you can sell more books from Amazon. Most of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're going to talk about are also applicable to uh, Barnes and Noble and Apple and Kobo and all those other places where you might also have your book up. Um, it's worth noting, however, that Amazon gives us as authors really the best tools and the most flexibility. Um, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to uh, evalu evaluate your book cover, and I really want you to take a hard look at your book cover. I'm going to show you some examples, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, in, in some more detail, I'll talk about those examples. But the key with your book cover, it is the first thing that people will look at when they go to your page. So if I go take a look, for example, at here, the target, the David Balducci's uh, book, I think it might be his latest one, um, you know, this, this book cover catches my eye immediately. It's on the top left page. We're a Western alphabet. We read from the left to the right and then down, left to right down. So typically, the most important element on a sales page is going to be up here on the top left, and there's the book cover. So the book cover um, has to stop my eye as a reader. When I get to your book page in Amazon, it's got to it's got to stop me, and it's got to stop me. It might have great color, it might have a great image, it might have uh, some some strange composition, but it has to grab me, it has to grab my attention, it has to make me look at it and become even more interested in your book than I was before I first came to the sales page. It's got to confirm the genre or the category. Um, so if you're writing, writing science fiction, your uh, book cover should perhaps follow some of the conventions of science fiction book covers. Or if it doesn't, you should at least know what those conventions are so when you decide not to follow them, you've got some really good reasons. Um, you might have a, uh, a, um, a time travel romance book. Um, so that's uh, speculative fiction plus romance. So you've got a bit of a genre mashup. So you've got a little more complex job when you're directing your book cover designer to do your book cover. Um, but you definitely want to convey, in other words, the, the easiest test is to, is to have your book cover designer send you your book cover without any text on it and show that book cover to people who read in your genre and who hopefully are in your target market and ask them, does this convey my genre? Does this convey romance? Does this convey cozy mystery? Does this convey science fiction? Does this convey fantasy? Does this convey vampire romance novel? Um, also, your book cover has to show that you've done this professionally. Now, it's pretty rare to be a great book cover designer and a great graphic artist and a great writer, it's probably pretty rare to be good at all three of those things. And that's why we recommend most authors, almost all authors, shouldn't do the book cover themselves. They should have a professional do it for them. Because the professional is going to know about standards of composition and typography, and they're going to make it readable as a thumbnail. 
um, you are going to provide them in your competitive brief with uh, the color palettes and samples uh, and examples and uh, text-based listings of the images that are very common on the covers of books in your genre. What kind of themes, what kind of image quality, all of those things sort of fall under the basket of uh, your professionalism as an author, and people are literally going to judge whether your book is worth reading by looking at your cover or not. They won't look at anything else. That'll be the first thing they look at, and they'll, they're will they going to make up their decision immediately, right there. And so your book cover has to look good. In fact, your book cover, your book cover will also, um, your book cover will also uh, set the tone in your readers on uh, how they write a review for your book. So if your book cover is strong, you are predisposing your readers to give you a good review. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Now, Samantha has just pointed out that she's just lost sound. Um, if someone out there can still hear me, let me know. My my uh, mic indicator says that it's still working, but I'm concerned that um, I'm concerned that it's not working now. Oh, okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry, Samantha, I guess it must have been just on your end, but thanks for letting me know. And by the way, stop me at any time. If you've got questions, if you think I'm throwing in some jargon here, and you or you want to challenge something that I'm saying, it won't hurt my feelings. Throw a question up there, and I will, uh, I'll answer it immediately. Also, if you've got a nonfiction book, you still need to do the first, things on, first three things on this list. You need to stop the eye. You need to confirm your genre and convey your professionalism. But if you've got a nonfiction book, you've you've got to also include your benefit promise. Um, so, you know, you've got a book on losing weight or on uh, how to make delicious recipes for Thanksgiving or w whatever your book is, how to cope with loss, how to overcome adversity, how to cure cancer, whatever the, the subject of your book is, there's got to be a benefit promise on your book. Uh, and so that benefit promise, benefit promise is something like lose 40 pounds in 40 days. Samantha's got a question. She says, is there a site that has these conventions, so I can do some research on them. And she's talking, of course, about the book cover. <laughs> it's, it's funny that you asked that, Samantha. Um, there's not a good place. What I recommend to authors, when I, say, when I say, when you write your creative brief for your professional book cover designer, you're going to give them, first of all, you're going to give them um, a link to or a pulled screenshot of 10 book covers that you think did something really well in your genre that you'd like them to emulate aspects of. And you're going to give them a list of, hey, in my genre, there's always a picture of the Pentagon, there's always a picture of a pistol, and there's usually a dark shadowy figure somewhere in a door, right? So because I'm writing a thriller or an espionage thriller. So you, as part of your job as an author, when you're art directing your um, book cover, you are telling the designer, because they're not going to read your book, you're going to tell the designer, in my genre, we always have cupcakes and a candle and a donkey. I mean, I don't know. I'm making that up. But whatever the answer is, and how do you do that research? You have to go look in your genre. Go look in the top 100 free and the top 100 paid in your genre and just make some notes and look at each one of those books. Say, gosh, it seems like there's always a football player or there's always a picture of a baseball on the books in my genre. So I need to make sure I tell my cover designer, hey, we should include a picture of a antique baseball cover, for example. And we're at BookFuel. We are in the midst of bringing to market a product, a service, actually. It's part of book, it'll be part of the BookFuel premium subscription, where at the click of a button, after you tell us your genres, it will go out and it will actually do a lot of this research, or at least save you a lot of clicks by aggregating all the information in one place so that you, with your human eyes, can actually look through it very quickly and say, oh, it looks like in my genre, a very common color palette is black and red or green and yellow, whatever the answer is. JJ's got a question. Is the benefit promise also the subtitle? So, um, JJ, that's an excellent question. The benefit promise um, is usually the subtitle. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the book might be Eat Smart. The subtitle might be Lose 40 Pounds in 40 Days. Johan says... Uh, um, can you inflate or defeat, deflate my ego by telling me about the cover of Polynesian Dreams? Johan, I would love to, and we'll take a look at that right now. So, so this is my book cover. I want to take a look at a couple examples, then we'll take a look at Johan's. He's being very brave. We will, of course, be very nice and professional. But I want to show you a couple of book covers in fiction examples, and I want you to ask yourself these three questions. 
is there an outstanding or arresting image? Does it confirm my genre or my subject area? Does it convey professionalism? So here are three books. And you might, when you look at the Atlantis gene, you might think to yourself, gosh, when Bill pulled that image off of Amazon, he must have stretched it horizontally somehow. Because it doesn't have the same aspect ratio of Shadow of Freedom, the book in the middle, or The Master, the book on the right. But I want to point out something to you. If we look at David Balducci's book, notice the aspect ratio of his cover image. Now, I'm willing to bet, we could probably, we could probably go down and look at it, but let's see what is his um, hardcover size. That would be a good question to know the answer to. So I go to paperback, and I look for his... It's eight by five and a half. So I wonder, um, well, now it looks like it's a better aspect ratio when I switched over to the paperback. So see what, see what David, David's publisher has done is that they've used a slightly different aspect ratio, it looks like to me, uh, on his ebook cover compared to when I look at his paperback cover. So let's find it kind of interesting. So going back to my example, A.G. Riddle, um, and this is a self-published book, The Atlantis Gene, clearly used a more square aspect ratio. And it kind of stands out. You know, when you see his book, especially in the also recommended bar versus some other ones, he's cleverly taken advantage of all of the pixel space, the pixel aspect ratio dimensions that uh, Amazon allows you to use. Compared to Shadow of Freedom, uh, a David Weber book, this one's professionally published. Um, I think it was an Orbit book, but I can't remember for sure. I think maybe in the Bain book for, uh, before. But um, this book is busy. I can't even tell what this bug is uh, in here. Uh, I think it might say New York Times bestseller series, bestselling series. And it is, by the way, a fantastic series, the Honor Harrington series. But it's clear that this is a book cover that was taken right from the, the print book. Because if I had this print book in my hand, I could read this small text much more easily than I can in this thumbnail format. And then on the right, I've got a self-published book here called The Master. I can't even read the author's name. Uh, according to the listing that it's in in Amazon, this is a, I believe this is a fantasy book or a speculative fiction book, but I have no idea what it is about. And it's very common for self-published authors to pick a red and black uh, background. It just doesn't look very good when you lay it all out. The typography here needs clearly some work to, to at least make the author's name more readable and help promote their brand. Let's take a look at a couple of nonfiction examples before we get to Johan's book. And by the way, if anyone else would like me to take a look at their book, um, uh, let me know, and I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the, th the, um, we'll put it in the queue right after Johan's. So here's some nonfiction examples. Um, let's see. I believe that on the left, this is a professionally published book. In the middle, we've got a self-published book. And on the right, we've got a self-published book. So I've got the Dan Daniel plan on the left. I like that the be I like the benefit promise, 40 days to a healthier life. My only worry is that uh, I actually have this blown up on my screen a little bit. My worry is that in an ebook thumbnail, I can't see that benefit promise very well. Um, but it's clearly got colors and images that are common to the genre of healthy eating. And so I think it fits well within a genre. It, it communicates to me what its genre is. Now, it's certainly it doesn't have any arresting images. If I took all the text off of that book, um, I could probably, I could, I might think it's a book about running and eating healthy as a runner. I'm not certain, or resting by the park. But it's clear to me that it's in the health area. Uh, but none of those images really grabs me. None of them really have um, have anything on them. So now let's take a look at the middle book by Dr. Romani Diversala. I think if I'm saying that name correctly, um, I think that she has picked that looks like an author picture as her arresting image. Um, I think it's very well done. That's clearly a it looks to me clearly like a professional uh, studio photograph. Um, uh, you her typography might need a little work. You are why you eat. The you are and the you eat look uh, a little harder to read and thumbnail to me. And she clearly has her benefit promise on here, change your food attitude, change your life. But again, I'm worried that that subtitle, that benefit promise, may be too small here. Um, then the third book, uh, I think the title is Addiction. This is a box set three by Dr. Miriam, I can't read the last one. 
So this one needs some serious work on uh, typography. Um, and I don't see a benefit promise anywhere on this self-published book. Okay, so we've got a bunch of questions that have rolled in here. Um, JJ wants us to take a look at his book. Uh, Lim, Lynn gave me a link, but it won't work in here. Sorry, Lim. Lynn, I, if you can give me the, the um, title of the book, I will do it. And Aurora, if your book is up on Amazon, tell me the title. And Kay, thank you very much. Um, I think I can read the Platinum Retriever Earth's Unexpected. Um, uh, Kay, if you'll send me the book title, that'll help. And Anne, I don't, uh, let's see, Aurora, Pupul, Daniel, Lauren. Okay, let's, let's, whoa, everybody's jumping in. This is fantastic. Okay, let's take a look real quick at the first one, Johan's book. So I'm going to look for Johan, comma, uh, let's see the, where is it? Um, Paul, Polly. Polynesian Dreams, Let's see if that finds it. Polynesian Dreams, okay, this looks like this is it. So here's Johan's book. Um, let's see if I can get it into full screen for us. Uh, let's make that a little bit smaller. That's not going to work. Oh, zoom minus, here we go. That's not going to work. So let's look at its thumbnail size. I'll blow it up a little bit for us. So here's Polynesian Dreams. Um, if I pull the title off, Johan, and I pull the author name off, so in other words, literally pull the text off. Um, I'm, I'm, the, the triangles, I'm not reading the triangles. So the triangles aren't communicating to me uh, precisely what my genre is here. And then if I roll down here, uh, it's not telling me what the, oh, sorry, here it is. So this is a memoir, a personal transformation book, memoir, personal growth. S so uh, memoirs are hard to do. M memoirs are... Um, are, they fall into a special category of nonfiction uh, in terms of marketing. A memoir can can be marketed as uh, using some of the tools of fiction. So um, I think many memoirs will have an author photo, uh, uh, sometimes an older one on them. Uh, when I say older, I mean an antique-looking photo for memoirs. Um, uh, but it's clear that you at least communicated the setting in here. So I think that's good. And I think that the... Um, I think that the basic typography you've got is good. I'm just not sure about the composition. And remember, I'm not a professional um, book cover designer, so I am actually not a great. Uh, I'm not a great person to add criticism. But what I really tell authors is, um, you need to ask. You need to take your book cover to your target audience and ask them those three or four questions. Um, does this image capture your eye? Does it make you stop? Does it make you more interested in my book? Um, does the uh, does it tell you what genre my book is, and uh, does it does it look like it was a professionally produced book? And then for nonfiction, is there a benefit promise on it? Let me see if I can catch up to the comments. Um, all right, here. Uh, let me see if I can get them in order. So, the Durable Human Manifesto. Let's try that one from JJ, real quick. The Durable. Durable Human Manifesto. Okay. All right, here it is. By Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer, I think I've got your book, and I've got the paperback version of it. Um, okay, so this book looks as though it is a... I'm just trying to find if it'll tell me at a glance what your genre or your category is, and we'll talk about those in a minute. It's not clear to me what your genre is uh, in here from Amazon. It's great that you got 13 reviews. I think that's fantastic. Um, but I don't see that the I don't see that maybe I've shrunk the screen too small. Just, Amazon has a an adaptive screen technology, and depending on what zoom level you use, they choose to show and not show other items. So I don't see what I'll, I'm going to assume it's um, um, a memoir, personal transformation book as well. Um, at this zoom level, I can clearly see that this is a crowd of people, uh, perhaps in exultation, which is fantastic. And the the I think that the uh, the typography is very readable. Um, it looks like "Hooray for Humans" is the tagline or the subtitle, although I don't see that officially entered in the system. Um, 
and I don't, of course, I don't see it as an ebook either, which is interesting. Um, I would have thought that you would put out an ebook as well. So I, I, the, the color scheme is seems different. I'm not an expert in personal transformation books or or uh, memoirs or self help books, but the color scheme you've chosen um, uh, uh, doesn't uh, look like a common one, which can be good. Which means it can it helps it stand out on a shelf. You know, it's always good to know what the common ones are, so then maybe you can either pick you decide to go with it or go against it. And if that's what you've done here, I think that's good as well. Let's do one more, and then I want to keep going, and then maybe at the end we'll come back and look at some more. So let's see, memory time, forgot, Daniel Ward. Let's try that one. Memory time, forgot, Daniel. Ah, okay, so here's one. Um, so it's, it's uh, red on black stands out. It absolutely stands out. The problem is, um, uh, I'm not a professional book designer, but it it um, it robs the the person looking at the book cover of perspective, uh, of depth perspective, and and here where you're using this this uh, what you've done is what you've done with the with the declining forgot on the background, which I think is an interesting touch. There's no image on here. All you're really doing is screaming red and black. And I think that um, you may want to consider uh, updating your cover. Let's see if we can figure out what um, genre you're in. Okay, so this is thrillers and suspense, post-apocalyptic thriller, science fiction, post-apocalyptic. So if I took all the text off, I'd have a black book. And uh, that doesn't tell me post-apocalyptic thriller. Uh, so in other words, you've... You you have an opportunity with a book cover to convey a visual to to convey the theme or the genre of your book visually, and without the text on the book, you are not taking advantage of that opportunity. So because you don't have any images, um, there's not uh, there's not you're not you don't have a chance to um, to convey that. So we'll we'll come back to some more of these at the end. But let's let's I want to keep rolling on the rest of the elements. The book cover is very important, but it's only the first one. I'd say it's almost the most important one, but but um, it kind of depends on what you're doing with the other things as well. Okay, so we've looked at some fiction examples, some nonfiction examples. Remember, nonfiction, you want to have a benefit promise unless you're um, uh, a memoir. Uh, in, the, in that case, the benefit promise may or may not be appropriate, especially if your book is told like yours is, and I think in more of a narrative nonfiction style. Okay, so social proof is next. Social proof is the number of reviews that you got on your uh, your book. So for example, we looked at David Balducci. I think he was right here. No, uh, I lost him because he was a few clicks ago. Um, he had 3,000 something reviews, which is just, that's huge. He's got a lot of fans. He's obviously sold a lot of books. And uh, what I tell everybody is you want to have a minimum of 12 reviews. In fact, I wouldn't spend a dime on marketing your book, I wouldn't try to generate any, any interest or any awareness with cash dollars until, excuse me, until you have a minimum of one dozen reviews. And and once you have a dozen reviews, it's okay to start marketing. Uh, uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but But keep pushing hard until you get to at least two dozen. And then you can start focusing on other elements of your marketing plan. But you want a couple of dozen reviews because... When people get to your Amazon page, they are looking for this number right here, this 3,542, or let's see, um, here's one, 349, here's 1,178. Uh, you know, they want to know how many reviews you've got, 137, 85, 111. And you'll, you'll find when you do your marketing that once you cross the 100 barrier, um, you're, you have the opportunity uh, to to fall into into the uh, if you like this you might like that category so you anecdotally what we see for authors is that you get a little bump when you pass a hundred um, reviews in fact the representative uh, uh, from Amazon I'm drawing a blank on his name right now I've been in several conferences with him and on on a couple panels and he said because he gets asked this question all the time what is my sales rank based on and he says I I can't tell you because I don't know 
but what our developers tell me is that sales rank is dependent on not only how many books you sell and how recently you've sold them, but it's also based on your review volume and your page hits. So, in other words, if people are going to visit your page a lot and you've got a constant trickle of reviews and you're selling books, you're going to have a higher sales rank. Um, and, of course, the, the star rating, not only does the stars matter, but I'm also going to uh, suggest this to you. So I'm going to just randomly pick this book by Bella Andre, okay? And we're going to go take a look at her reviews. Now, notice her distribution of reviews. She's got uh, uh, five stars, four stars, three stars, two stars, and one. And if I look at her books, it looks like the first visible set of reviews are all five-star reviews. Now, I know that she's got plenty of other, in this case, more than 20% of her remaining reviews are not five-star reviews. Now, I don't know if, um, if Bella Andre or someone that works for her does this, but I'm going to suggest that if your book is up in Amazon, that you want to give some consideration to this little area down here called, Was This Review Helpful to You? So, look, everybody is going to have, even Bella Andre, a very successful author, is going to have one-star reviews and two-star reviews and three-star reviews. What matters is that those reviews are not on this first page, the first page that I scroll through. The number of people that actually go beyond the first page is small. So what you'd like to do is, if you had it in your power, you'd like to have the good reviews float to the top. Well, you can influence that. You can influence that by using this functionality right down here. Was this review helpful to you? Yes or no? Now, you say, well, gosh, if I, the author, go through and click on yes and no to try and influence the rank of the reviews in, on my book, that's not going to have much effect. That's true. And what I say in return is, do you have any friends? Do you have any family members that use um, Amazon that might be willing to just take five minutes if you ask them to go in here and uh, upvote and downvote some reviews to help you out? So uh, there's nothing wrong or sneaky or unethical about it. Ask them to go take a look at the reviews. And ask them if it's a good review, would they mind clicking on yes? This helps the good reviews float up to the top of this first page. And so that's why I say here, um, oh, number, the number of reviews matters, but their order matters as well. So you want to have the nice reviews show up on the front part of your page. Also, I want you to, uh, you, you, you're going to ask, how do I get more reviews? Bill, you said I need two dozen. I don't have three. I don't have any. How do I get more reviews? Um, again, we're, we are working on a tool that will help you find Amazon reviewers that might be willing to review your book. But until that tool comes out, um, I can recommend without reservation that you take a look at the Author Marketing Club tool. Unfortunately, the Author Marketing Club tool is expensive. It costs, to get access to it, you have to join Author Marketing Club. It's $107 for the year. And we don't, you know, I, I, they don't know who we are, and, but we rec I do recommend them because they've got a couple of nice tools. But they've got a, a tool called the Amazon Reviewer Grabber tool, and it does a good job of um, it does a good job of of uh, giving you the, the contact information for potential reviewers uh, that might review books in your genre. Anne's got a question. She says, "I keep getting contacted by Google to to pay to put my book in a directory. Is this necessary?" And I have to tell you, I've never ever heard of that. And I'm deeply suspicious that that's a scam. Um, Amazon is uh, not in the business of, um, of doing that, as far as I know. And there's no directory that they have, I think, that, uh, that you want to put a book in. OK, how to improve your ratings, get to my stars. So uh, obviously, y you need to get your book professionally edited. Um, because you don't want the first four reviews on your page to be, well, after the fourth misspelling, misspelling I couldn't get any further. This was a great book, except all of the grammar mistakes knocked me out of the narrative flow. Um, uh, you've got friends, family, Facebook, a blog campaign. But one thing I want you to also consider doing is putting HTML links in the back of your book. So I'll show you an example of that. So here's a book. Uh, let's see. This is by B.B. Larson. This is the last page in his book, um, 
called Rebellion. And, oh, no, sorry, this is, this is actually a different book. This wasn't Rebellion. This was the book right before Rebellion. And what B.B. Larson has done, this is, this is a screen capture that I used. I used Adobe Digital Editions to capture literally the last two pages of his book, of his e-book, opened uh, face to face. And what he did at the end of his book, you can see there's the last sentence of his story. In short, we were in trouble. And then he, he says, you know, that's the end of the excerpt. And then here's some more books from B.B. Larson. So he's got links, literally, that go to the Amazon listings for all of his other books. There's nothing wrong with putting a link in the back of your book that says, uh, author, and, and this is the best time. The author has just finished, the, the reader has just finished your book, and uh, you've got their attention, you've got their interest, uh, they're, they're in that post book, I finished it glow, and uh, that is the perfect time to humbly ask them if they would consider reviewing your book, and then give them a link to back to your book, uh, so that they can go, and when they click on the link, uh, assuming they do it on a device that has a browser, it will let them automatically review the book. Now, uh, since originally we started originally recommending this, Amazon has started to do that for some books automatically. Um, I just don't know the parameters, whether they do it for everybody or whether you need to do it for yourself. So consider end of the book links not only to promote your other books, not only to promote your homepage, as B.V. Larson does here, but also promote uh, the chance to leave a review for your book. Okay, let's talk about pricing. So we talked about book covers. Um, so we're talking about each of the elements in turn on a book page. So the first thing, the most important thing, we talked about your book cover. It's the first thing people are going to look at. The next thing they're going to look at, how many reviews do you have? And what's your average star rating? Right? They want to know... Um, there, most people aren't going to do the look inside. They're not going to click on your book and read the first few pages. That's a, that's a buying behavior that's executed most often in a bookstore. So as a substitute for trial, um, they're going to look at, they're going to see, oh, some other people have read this book, and clearly they liked it. So I'll probably like it too, since it's in my genre, and it looks interesting. And Well, maybe I'll go down and read the book description in a minute to see if I really like it. But okay, now I'm interested uh, you've got my interest, and now I, I sort of I'm not going to try it myself, but it looks like other people have, so I can move on from there. So after those two elements, the price is the next thing they look at, right here. You know, this book, Bella Andre's got this book priced at four ninety nine. She is a well established author with a well established um, uh, reader base, and uh, she's got a brand name in her space. She can probably get away with charging four ninety nine for her ebook as a self published author. I probably can't get away with that. Um, Peter asked me a question. Sorry, I'll go back. Peter, so I can roll the slide back for you. He said, what was the name of that website? And by the way, you all are welcome to send me an email, and I would be happy to send these slides. Um, bookreviewbroker.com. Okay, so bookreviewbroker.com, I have that listed here, but I'm going to suggest that you tread carefully. Um, I've heard very mixed reviews. Some people have had success with it. And some people have not. Essentially, it's a service where the person that runs bookreviewbroker.com apparently has a database of people that are willing to do reviews. And you will pay for access to some names from that database. And then you will submit a letter to them uh, asking for a review. Before I went and did anything with bookreviewbroker.com, I would try the Author Marketing Club Dot com first. Try their Amazon review scraper. Okay, so now let's talk about price, right? We're talking about each of the key elements, and the next one that people are going to look at is how much am I pricing my book at? Now, there, there's three core philosophies, right? There's, I should make my, my book for free, and I only recommend making your book for free under two conditions, and no, one of them is not that I want, I don't want to make any money. <laughs> the two conditions are, first of all, uh, that Although this book is free, it happens to be the first in a series of at least three books. So once you've got a series, or it doesn't have to be a direct series, it can be a, a set of related books all in the same uh, a world that you might have built, um, the fiction, fictional world that you might have built, feel free, feel free, feel free with experimenting about setting your price for free. Now, those of you who've worked with Amazon know that you cannot, in Amazon, directly set your book uh, at zero dollars. 
you actually have to set it at probably 99 cents or 399 probably probably better to set it at 299 and then go to smashwords and upload the exact same ebook although you'll have to use a mobi file and then let it sit there for a couple of weeks and then have one of your friends uh, email amazon or try it yourself and say hey this book seems to be free on Amazon, but I notice it's not free on, it has to be free on Smashwords, but I notice that it's not free on your website. And Amazon, probably pretty quickly, will set your book for free and will leave it there permanently. The other time, and, and so that's one time that I recommend trying the free strategy. The other time is on a limited basis. So if you are doing the Kindle Select program, which as you know, gives you five free days a quarter, um, why am I blanking on that? It's either three or five. Um, I think it's five free days a quarter. Uh, the, the, the Kindle Select program allows you to temporarily set your book as free to encourage people to download it for up to five individual days in a given quarter of enrollment in the program. When you do that, if you do that, you got to remember two things. Number one, don't jump all the, dump all the days in a row. Um, you want to you probably want to do a two two one or a two one 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 strategy, or a two one two strategy, number one. So that and and then typically number two, you want to typically launch that promotion if it's a two day promotion on a Friday or if it's a one day promotion on a Friday or a Saturday, um, so that you get the the best exposure um, because that's typically when people are out there buying books for the weekend. And then the last thing is, if you're going to do that strategy, I strongly recommend that you pre-plan using a service like FreeBooksy or BookBub, and BookBub takes quite some planning because they curate their offerings, um, to promote the fact that your book is free. I mean, if you're going to put it up for free and you're looking for 10,000 downloads or 20,000 downloads, um, uh, you probably want to use one of the services to promote it. The next strategy for pricing is to make your book 99 cents. And uh, Mark Coker of Smashwords, uh, he's a, a good guy, and he is so nice. He shares a tremendous amount of data uh, because they sell a lot of ebooks through Amazon uh, and through their own store. And every year at Romance Writers Association, he gives a talk on uh, book price elasticity. And the, sh the short and long of his talk is this. At 99 cents, you'll get maximum readership, but not maximum revenue. Somewhere in the $2.99 to $3.99 range, I'm sorry, to four to $9.99 range, somewhere in there is where you price for maximum revenue from your book. Meaning fewer people will buy it, but you'll make more per book. So, you know, obviously we all know that at $2.99, that's where the 70% royalty kicks in for Amazon. So at $2.99, I'm taking home about $2.09 roughly of each book. Two dollars and ten cents, depending on how you round it, of of each book that I sell. Compare that when I sell it at ninety nine cents, and I only take home thirty five cents of that book, or thirty four cents again, depending on where you round. Um, that's a difference of six x. So if I sell one book at two ninety nine, I make the same revenue as I as selling one book at ninety nine cents. So again, maximum revenue uh, is the other strategy, and it depends on where you are in your book launch. Now, um, uh, Samantha says, what if you tweak on the price slightly and go 277? Can you do that? Actually, yes, Samantha, you can. The only reason 277 in particular and any price between a dollar and 298 is not a good idea is because from a dollar, from 99 cents to two dollars and 98 cents, you only make 35 percent royalty from Amazon. And so if you're going to go 277, you might as well go 299 and, and take the sales head, but get a massive revenue gain. But if you had instead asked, well, what if I price my book at 349 or 377 or 399 or 398? So I'm still in that 70% zone. Um, I might get fewer readers. And so what, what Mark Coker says with his data every year is that the, the point at which you price your book for maximum revenue um, is is moving a little bit, and it's moving up a little bit, and it varies. Uh, it varies by time of year, and it varies by genre, and he doesn't actually have all of that data yet. So he gives really big aggregate numbers, and he says basically it's 99 cents or 2.99. That's the two ways you want to do it, unless there's a 
a pricing element to your author brand. And so that's you know Bella Andre. She's got a strong author brand, and she wants people to perceive her books to be worth more. So she's pricing at four ninety nine. Let me give you a look at that sort of power curve. So and now we're getting kind of technical, but pricing pricing books follows a power curve relative to book prices. So what that means is that you know if you sell your book at ninety nine cents um, versus selling at three forty nine you'll get about twice as many readers, um, but you'll get one-third the net revenue. And, and the inflection point for ma maximum net earnings is it's sensitive to Amazon's royalty breaks and the exponent of the power curve. So there's science behind this, but because Amazon doesn't reveal um, exactly, it uh, doesn't reveal sales data, what you're going to have to do as an author is you're going to have to experiment. So Lynn's got a question for a series. How do you recommend using Kindle Select? I noticed that I had a little less as far as sales when I made my second book free, which makes sense because a reader might not want to purchase the first. Yeah, Lynn, I would say um, that uh, I would, uh, if you got three books, I would con strongly consider making the first book in your series free. If it's professionally edited and it's doing well and it's got good reviews, and if at the end of the book it's clear that there's more happening, and or if at the end of book one, you have cleverly inserted the first three chapters of book two as a preview to book two, and at the end of that included a link, I think that would be a fantastic marketing strategy for you. Um, and JJ says, uh, could you please repeat the percentage you get past 299? Yes. So the, the way Amazon's royalty bans work is that the lowest you can actively price a book in Amazon is 99 cents. If you price the book from 99 cents to 298, you'll earn 35% of what's sold. If you price it from $2.99 to $9.99, you'll earn 70% of the price it was sold at. If you price your book at $10 and higher, and I think in Amazon $200 is the highest you can price for any book, I think. From, nine, from $10 to, to $200, you go back to the 35% royalty. So they're, you know, they're clearly trying to, with this pricing ban, they were trying to give an incentive to publish, excuse me, to publishers who thought that their books were worth eleven ninety nine or twelve ninety nine or thirteen ninety nine to just price their book at nine ninety nine because they'd actually make more money selling the book at nine ninety nine than they would make at selling it at fourteen dollars. Uh, Peter's got a question: Can those here who would like to network with others here send you their email address for you to distribute? So. Uh, Peter's got a suggestion, and it's one we're working on, but I'll go ahead and act on it today if you'd like, Peter. He says, uh, if you all who would like to network and talk about this are willing to, to share email addresses with everyone, sometime in the next few days, send me an email, and I'll show my email address here at the end again. Send me an email with your email and say, yes, Bill, I'd like to network th with the other authors, and I will set you all up on a one-time email where I, will, where I will share that address out to everyone so that you can connect with each other and compare stories and compare results. I think it's a great idea, Peter. Okay, uh, pricing. So we talked about the Amazon royalty brands. And Samantha says, I swear I will review it if we do that. That's very nice, Samantha, to offer to review the other author's books. I will caution you, though, um, there was a period about uh, 14 months ago where Amazon, uh, this is what you're suggesting, got... got uh, uh, upset's not the right word. They unilaterally with, uh, wiped out the reviews of a number of authors' books where they had um, um, seen reviews from other authors. So it was sort of like uh, the author review circle, and, it's, and they had some algorithms. They figured out that that was going on, and they, and they wiped out, in some cases, all the reviews, in some cases, only the author's reviews. So just something to be aware of if you go in that direction. Okay, so we're running out of time. I'm going too slow. So let's, we've talked about um, pricing considerations. Where is your book in its life cycle? And at the very bottom here, I want you to run experiments. Not weekly, not daily, but uh, think about running a monthly. Tweak your price. Find your best clearing price. Is it $299? Is it $349? Is it $329? Is it $399? Where are you making the most money? Okay, let's talk about your book description real quick. So I'm going to take a look here at David, at Bell Andre's book description. Okay, ouch, first, my first problem with her book description is the show more button. So in order to read her old book description, I've got to show more, and I have to show a lot more. Wow. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do that. I don't know if I'm in that invested in this book. Let me pick another one. Let's pick fluency just as an example. 
Um, let's find her book, uh, her book description or this book description. Ah, here we go. I got to show more again. So first thing I would say is I don't, I, I would be very careful about uh, having so much book description that your book description has a show more button on it. Um, even when I change the zoom of my screen, the font size, I don't think that there are too many first time readers that have never heard of you that unless you've got something really compelling here at the end of this first paragraph, we're going to click on the show more button. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was looking at the review from the editor. So here I am in book description. So this is great. There's no show more at all. I can read this in one shot. Uh, and my screen is pretty wide. And, um, and so what I recommend to authors is that um, for your fiction book, there's a kind of a formula here. And I've got the formula on the screen. When blank happens to blank, he or she must blank or face blank. So, for example, uh, marked for death along with his companions, a toy rabbit must learn to cry real tears in order to save himself from being thrown into a burning pit by the boy he loves. Right? If, if you all are familiar with the child, childhood story, the Velveteen Rabbit. You know, that's a pretty compelling uh, a hook, right? Um, you know, you've got the setting, you've got the antagonist, you've got the conflict. You got the protagonist. Well, the protagonist is not really mentioned here, but at the end, you've got an emotional hook, right? And so, take a look at your book description in Amazon and ask yourself: Is it? Do I have a show more button or not? Number one. Number two. Am I le am I ending with an emotional hook? That's really important. Um, as well, if you've got a nonfiction book, though, your formula is a little bit different. I want you to lead with your benefit promise, followed by your unique proposition followed by your authority or your credibility, followed by the call to action. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, the example is this. Um, I'll kind of make this up. Um, lose 20 pounds in 20 days with uh, the soup diet. Enjoy these 20 uh, award-winning soup recipes from me, a five-star chef uh, who has spent the last 20 years uh, making soup at the best Michelin Guide restaurants in Europe. Uh, scroll up and buy a copy now and start deliciously souping your way to weight loss. Okay, I made all that up. But the point is, you get it. you got to lead with your benefit promise, tell what's unique about your book, demonstrate your credibility or your authority, and then ask them to scroll back up or, or to start doing something today which involves your book lay words. <laughs> that shouldn't be lay words. I think I threw that in at the very last. That should be keywords. We'll talk about keywords in just a moment. And then also the last thing I want to point out is I want you to, uh, well, I mentioned Author Marketing Club before, you can buy, you, not buy, you can sign up for a trial uh, membership uh, at Author Marketing Club. I think it lasts 20 days or 30 days. And if you haven't done it, just to look around, you should because it will give you access to their Amazon Description Generator tool. And the Amazon Description Generator tool you go find, see if I, I don't know if I brought one of those up. Uh, let's see if um, let's see if Michael Hicks is using it. Um, let's see. I'd be kind of surprised if he wasn't. He's a very good author uh, in terms of doing this stuff right. Well, he doesn't use it. But again, here's his book description ending on an emotional hook. He hasn't used a formatter. I think the David Balducci book has some decent formatting in it. Let's see. Uh, in the Kindle version. So here's something you need to know very quickly. Amazon, it doesn't, look at that. Amazon allows you to insert HTML tags in your book description. So after your book description is uh, perfect, after it's text perfect, you may want to add some formatting so that it pops, so that it stands out, so that it looks better. Um, again, I want to see if I can find one. I think I just saw one a moment ago when we were, I should have queued one up for us. Well. The key, when you go look at the demo, you'll see it. And the bottom line is, I don't know how to teach HTML tag things. I haven't. I don't even know how to spell HTML. But the bottom line is, if I use the Author Marketing Club tool, and okay, no secret, Book Fuel is going to try to create one as well. <clears throat> um, I can quickly format my book description so it looks really good and very compelling. Okay, let's go look. Okay, categories. So this is important. Your book should be in two Kindle ebook categories and two Kindle book categories. So picking the two Kindle ebook categories is easy. You pick the biggest one that's most relevant, where people would definitely be browsing for your book. Uh, and yeah, the Johan says you can use HTML to make your words bold and underline, etc. And Johan, you can use HTML in the Kindle description to match the Amazon heading, so it looks 
uh, even better in there. It's very cool. So uh, Amazon calls them browse paths. You and I call them genres or categories. First thing you need to know is that they are different in the Amazon Kindle store versus the Amazon uh, bookstore. So for example, here is the list of all the science fiction categories available in the Amazon Kindle store. Here is the list of all the science fiction categories available in the Amazon book store. Notice that the list is not a one for one match. In fact, I don't even think it's a subset. Um, is there one? Yeah, so here's one. So for example, here's high tech. In the book, in the book list, high tech doesn't exist over here in the Kindle list. So it's two unique sets. And um, and they have different sub-genres as well underneath them. So the point is you need to pick two on the Kindle side and two on the ebook side. And just to give you an idea of how much these change, um, oh, I lost them. Um, I brought them up before. So if I go to uh, departments and I go to, oh, let's see, no, I'll just do this. I'm going to go to the Kindle store. Let's look at the Kindle ebook. So Kindle store, go. And then I'm going to look here on the side at uh, Kindle eBooks. There's 2.9 million of them. And then I'm going to look at uh, science fiction and fantasy. Then I'm going to look at science fiction. I just want to show you how they've even changed since I uh, originally put this slide together. So here's the science fiction list. Adventure, alien invasion, alternative history, anthology, genetic engineering, hard science fiction, and so forth. And here's the list I pulled. So... I'd have to look real quickly and see if I spot any that are specifically different. I don't, but one thing that's interesting is you can see how many more books there are now than there were then. So when I originally took this slide, there were almost 20,000 adventure books. Now there are 25,000. There are 25% more books now than there were just a year ago in just that category alone. So you've got a lot of competition out there. You've got to really work on this Amazon sales page to make it look good. Uh, let's talk about keywords because we're almost done. We're almost out of time. Keywords are critical, especially for your nonfiction. They're useful for science fiction, but they're critical for uh, nonfiction as well, uh, or mostly for nonfiction. Amazon is now the dominant search engine for products. Um, more people go to the Amazon search bar, this bar right here, and they search for products, motherboard, uh, then go to the Google search bar to search for products, right? More people are looking in Amazon for things than uh, to buy than are using Google to find them to buy. So your book has keywords in it. And not just, I don't mean in the text, although uh, Amazon could be indexing these, we don't know. But what we do know is that your book clearly has uh, words in its title, in its subtitle. When you upload your metadata, you have to pick seven key phrases or keywords. You separate each one of the seven by commas. For example, lose weight, time travel, speak with confidence, military history, the name of a character, Honor Harrington, the title of a book in her name. Those are all unique key phrases that would help people find my book. And you need to think critically about them. And you need to, especially if you have a, non, a nonfiction book, you need to do some research. You know, when people are looking for books on how to lose weight, do they search for the word soup? No, but they might search for the word days, or they might search for the word delicious, or they might search for the word easy. So if my subtitle is <clears throat> 20 easy to make delicious soup recipes for your diet. Um, I'm using some pretty powerful keywords in there that dieters might be looking for. So you need to think about your book's keywords. You need to do some research on them and apply them in your book description, apply them in your title, in your subtitle, Apply them in your metadata as well. Okay, last thing I'm going to talk about is your Amazon author page. Um, you know, even if you're using a pen name, I want you to set up an Amazon author page. Uh, Amazon author pages are great. Let's see if I've still got uh, a Hicks one up here. Uh, hold on. Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay, so Michael Hicks. I've read a couple of his series. I really uh, visit his page. I really like Michael Hicks. I like his style of writing. And... Um, here's a little author, author bio about Michael. Here's the fun photo that he's uh, part of his author brand, you know, pilot kind of guy. So that sort of that, that uh, uh, rings a bell with me. If I like speculative fiction or science fiction, I'd like to be a pilot. Um, over here, I can follow him on Twitter, and his Twitter feed is being loaded automatically into this page. He, blo he blogs. So right here, his blog is telling 
uh, readers about his uh, latest version, his latest book, Black Gate, which I just purchased this weekend, but I haven't read yet. Um, it's got a list of all of his books down here. Um, he has uh, a video. I think this is going to be a video promoting the In Her Name series. It's about one minute long. I won't click on it because it won't show very well over over uh, our system. But and then at the bottom, let's see if he. Yeah, he does. He's so he's got. There's a forum, and uh, he participates in the forum. I believe he does. Um, and so here's a chance for him to interact with authors as well. I mean, sorry, interact with readers as well. So if you don't have an Amazon author page. You want to put one up there. You want to, to start using it as a platform, hopefully to drive people to follow you on Twitter, to drive them back to your blog, because here we hear the blog post. It's only his first paragraph, or sometimes not the, even the whole first paragraph. But this is designed, tra designed to drive traffic back to his website, where what's he going to do? He's going to ask for your email address. So he can tell you the next time his book, when his next book comes out. Um, so an Amazon author page is valuable, uh, similar to the way you might set one up on Goodreads. I highly recommend putting a, one up on Amazon. Okay, I went through it pretty quickly. Uh, we got to look at a few book covers. I'd love to look at some more, but again, I'm not a professional book cover designer. Um, I, what I would really say is you want to go to your target audience, and you want to ask them these questions. Is this image on my title good? Does this image on my title tell you what my genre is without any text and without a title? Um, uh, does, does my book cover look like it was professionally done? In other words, does it imply to you that my book is professionally edited and that it would be a good read? And of course, always look at your book cover, especially if you didn't write, uh, haven't written a memoir, and see if there's a benefit promise there and see if it's readable in that very, very small thumbnail view at, uh, on the Amazon bookstore. So now I'd be happy to take any questions you've got. I'll throw my email address up here, and I'll remind everybody uh, that if you'd like to send me an email and tell me to share your email address with everyone else, I would love to do. Um, I would love to connect the people that want to get connected and work together. I'd be happy to do it. Oh yeah, JJ's got a very important question. She said the pricing I looked at is for eBooks, not print. So let's go back there for one second. That's a very good. A distinction. So these prices right here are positively uh, related to ebook pricing. For your print book pricing, especially your print on demand book pricing, um, you're going to want to think critically about what is the pricing of the other books in your genre. So look critically at the top 100 paid list within your category and look at, you know, make yourself a little histogram. Look at where everyone seems to be pricing their book in general. Now, the one thing that's hard that you've got to factor in when you're doing uh, print book pricing is if your book is long versus if it's short, the, the Im imputed cost uh, given to your book by CreateSpace when you upload it is going to set a floor on your pricing. What I would say uh, sort of categorically across all of your uh, print pricing is the following. If you're writing genre fiction, I want you to think about your book, your printed book, as uh, uh, printed book sales as sort of a nice to have. Meaning this, uh, genre fiction readers are amongst all reader categories making the fastest transition into the ebook world. And so probably the majority of your sales are going to come from your ebooks. You are providing a print on demand version of your book as a convenience. And so if, if I were pricing my print-on-demand book, I'd price it so that I, I'm not going to make a fortune. I'm not going to make $5 a book. I probably won't be able to price it competitively if, if I tried to. If I make a buck, 50 cents, 75 cents every time one of my print-on-demand books is sold, I think that pricing is pretty good. Maybe there's some upward room because of my, my author brand or where the pricing is in general in my genre. Um, but uh, uh, I, I would count on... In genre fiction land, most of your sales coming from ebooks, and so don't worry about pricing your print on demand book for a heavy profit. Okay, Lynn's got a question. Is there a chance we could have a webinar set where you could work with us on our book covers, websites, and Amazon pages like you did with a few people today? You know, Lynn, that's a great idea. Um, I will consider doing that. Uh, I think it would be good. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd want to do more of an open call so we could give more people time to chime in rather than just me, and I'd want to have I know this is going to sound terrible, but I'd want to have one of our book cover designers on with me so we could talk about the book covers. 
uh, and more than just my questions, they could actually tell you what they think. But that's a great idea, Lynn. I will see if I can schedule one of those. We have reached the end of our time. Everybody, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found this valuable. Again, if you'd like the slides, I am always happy to send the slides. Just send me a quick email, and I'll bounce them right out to you. In a day or so, you should probably get a reminder with a link back to this, uh, a link to review this video if you'd like. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks again for joining me. I appreciate it.